There we go. All right. But the men put forth their hands and brought Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness who were at the door of the house, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves groping for the door. The ravaging people of Sodom were already trying to break open the door. Consequently, it was time for the guests to protect themselves and do a, a kind deed for so generous and faithful a, a host who was trying everything that seemed useful for their safety. Lot did not know that they were angels. He thought that they were men in the churches and were teaching the word far and wide. Therefore, he worshiped God in them and honored them, following his guests who had been sent by God. And he and his entire house received a very rich reward for this godly conduct. In the first place, he is offended against the ravaging people, for as Lyre II remarks, the angels do not smite them with such blindness that they see nothing at all but they smite them with confusion so that they even if they did, did see, they still could not make out what they were seeing. Just as a drunk person has his eyes open and sees, but does so without being able to make out what he sees, for he does not recognize what he sees. And my comment on that is the guy must really be drunk. <clears throat> this, the Hebrews properly call. You want to try that? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, shut yeah, I think it's um, shut up. I think. Pretty close. Okay, shut up. Okay, the people of Sodom saw the door, but they erred in their judgment and thought that it was the wall. On the other hand, they thought that the walls were the door. This is not a natural blindness. It's a miracle blindness, a miraculous blindness. It involves a mind and is called achrista and also achrista. Anyhow, the loss of function, not of faculty. Thus, this, uh, yeah. Thus, uh, Syri uh, Syrians did not see Elisha and his servant, and the Jews did not see Christ in the temple. God employs a miracle like this to rescue his own, whom he wants to protect even while enemies are looking on. This is called being deprived of the function, not of the faculty of sight. The actual seeing is taken away, as is stated in the Gospel of Luke 24, 16. The eyes were kept from recognizing him. Thus, Magdalene thought that Christ was the gardener. And the Syrians did not see that they were, were being laid aside, well, being led aside in this area, even though they saw everything else. In like manner, the people of Saul who were about to break down the door were stricken with blindness by the angels so that the door and the windows disappear from their sight. But when he had been delivered in a... miraculous manner so that they escape while, while sport, so to speak, is being made of their eyes of their enemies. But here one must note a difference. The Syrians who had been stricken with blindness by the prophet improve when they feel the hand of the Lord. But when the people of Sodom feel the hand of the Lord, they do not improve. They are blind throughout the entire night. 
and do not stop looking for the door until they are utterly fatigued and worn out. In what frame, frame of mind do you suppose Locke was here? While sitting all night and expecting the citizens to bust in at any moment. But the angels undoubtedly cheered him with the assurance that the, this effort of the sodomites would be in vain. So Lot, and particularly his wife and daughters, spent the whole sleepless night worrying and sleeping and weeping. But when the people of Sodom realized they had been smitten with blindness, they do not all at all accept this as a punishment inflicted by the Lord. They suspect that it is some magic and believe that they have been bewitched by Satan. This is the way it always happens that the ungodly are most obdurate and conclude that they are being caressed in God's bosom while the godly, on the other hand, are terrified and fear God's wrath. They conclude that the scourge is being sent by an angel, uh, by an angry God, not by Satan. For this reason, they are greatly terrified at the sound of a falling leaf. And after afraid of everything that persists, that presents no danger. They cannot have the thoughts that the ungodly have, that the devil is the author of these misfortunes as he actually is. For God does not afflict the godly. He permits the devil to do this, as we see in the case of Job whose children are killed by fire and his cattle by storm, not because God was angry with him, but because Satan was. Therefore, when a plague and other misfortune assails us, we too should say that these are the works of Satan, that Satan is raging and is angry, but that God is merciful and is kindly disposed towards us because we believe in his son. And in this manner, the saint <coughs> came death and all dangers, for they were sure that God was kind to them. They concluded that their tortures and their afflictions were due to magic and the devil and were permitted by God for the purpose of testing their faith. Therefore, they even rejoiced in their adversities and scoffed at Satan. We should do the same thing, but we are very frequently overcome by weakness, as the examples even of great saints prove. For Paul too is filled with fear and he guards, regains his courage when he sees the brethren, Acts 28, 15. Such fear is not felt by the ungodly for they are sure of God's favor. Quoting even though some adversity befalls them, they smugly attribute this to Satan. In like manner, when the people of Sodom have been smitten with blindness, they realize what has happened to them, but they do not accept this as punishment inflicted by God. They imagine that a, a magic formula has been used against them and that they have been bewitched by Lot. If we were able to do this and to imitate the ungodly in this respect, we would be happy. Yet countless more dependable promises invite us to this state of happiness. Moreover, these truths should be carefully impressed and taught, lest we yield to the flesh when we are tried or our re reason, tried or to our reason when we distinguish the word, for it is not God who torments us if we believe in Christ, it is the devil. He hates you and looks for opportunities to trouble you. But you will say, I realize that I am a sinner. Therefore, I am not a, I am not a Christian. Therefore, if any evil befalls me, it is sent by an angry God. But this conclusion is false for those who believe in the forgiveness of sins are Christians. Therefore, if you believe in Christ, if you gladly hear his word and receive it in faith, you are a true Christian and your sins do not stand in the way. Hence, if any misfortune befalls you, conclude boldly that it is from the devil and does not mean that God is unfriendly towards you, except insofar as he lets this happen as a trial in order to put your faith to the test for your own good. 
learn from your enemies and from the enemies of God that although the threats properly applied to them, they do not recognize this fact, but appropriate and comfort themselves with the promises. You too must do this, for it is a disgrace for you to be ignorant of the true doctrine which you profess. You fear God and believe in God, and therefore not the law, but the God. Gospel applies to you. But for your sake, the gospel and appropriate, the law, which concern not you, but the object and the smug. This is a spiritual weakness of which all saints complain. It is useful for repressing pride in order that we may not put our trust in ourselves, but may humbly humble ourselves and learn to truly solely in the grace which God offers us in his son. I'm sorry, to trust solely. It is most certainly true that God is not angry with us. Otherwise, he would not give us the most excellent knowledge of his son. Nor would he give us the Holy Spirit, whose first fruits we have received. Therefore, we also confess the Son of God and do not blaspheme him as the papists do. And we resist sin to a, a degree. Therefore, it would be desirable that we be like the people of Sodom in this respect, that we follow, we following their example, laugh at and consider as a jest the ravagings of Satan, but steadfastly conclude that we who believe in Christ are loved and protected by God, as is truly the case. Where our translation has, so that we were able, so that they were unable to find the door, the Hebrew is they wearied themselves groping for the door. Ilunk, I don't know, is a familiar verb. From it is derived a, a languid, feeble, deficient girl who, as it seems, would not live for weakness. Thus, this expression serves to describe the incorrigible stubbornness. They did not stop when they were stricken with blindness, but they kept up the laborious search. They had begun, kept it up until weariness compelled them to, to cease. And as usually happens in the case of tired people, they were overcome with sleep. Somebody want to take this from here? Let's. Uh... Whoa, let's have a discussion here. Okay. Maybe I'm, I missed out on something, but the angels were, came to see Lot, correct? Is that what? Yeah, they can't, the, the two, well, the two angels are the, how many showed up with Lot. There were three, um, one probably the pre-incarnate Christ. Two of those went on to uh, Sodom uh, to see the significance of the sins um, and to correct the problem. And when they got to to the city, Lot invited them to his house. And uh, so there's two there. And then when Lot goes out to try to keep the mob from busting in, uh, he's unsuccessful. The angels pull him in the door and then they strike the crowd with blindness. That help. Okay. okay. And and then uh, where are we going now? Well, that Luther is discussing this at this point, and he's making the point that uh, uh, when that happened, they didn't recognize that they were being punished by God. Uh, they think that they're in good shape. Um, there's nothing wrong with what they're doing or what they want to do. And so um, I mean, that's their mindset. 
And so when they're struck with his blindness, uh, he tries to describe it as uh, kind of like being drunk, but uh, being so drunk that uh, <laughs> you see things, but you don't. Almost like DDTs. Uh, I think that's what they call it. Anyhow, that uh, he's gone on talking about that and the, the um, those people who, who are not Christian not recognizing uh, that it was a punishment from God, but that if it came upon uh, a Christian, that uh, he may think that uh, God is displeased with him. And he goes on with the discussion concerning that. Um, and uh, the pain and suffering may simply be a test of his faith. Uh, that God doesn't do that. He uses uh, Satan as the agent to do that. But Satan doesn't do that simply to please God. He uh, does it because of his anger and his hatred for us. Well, this mob was, uh, that sounded to me a little bit like the angels blinding the masses there. It was a little bit of a self-defense maneuver. Yeah. More than a self-defense, yeah. It, it <laughs> oh, was, okay. Okay. Um, that's, uh, that's what went on. It, uh, it prevented them from coming in and uh, making a mess of things. So, okay, and then, then it goes on to say that uh, the the masses or who did this mob probably thought that this blindness was some kind of a uh, hocus pocus yeah. uh, thing that Lot had pulled on them. Right. Okay. Anybody no, it, else? Does that sound right, bud? Well, yeah, I remember I was thinking, you know, over the week that we were talking about, and you and I have talked about this, that, the thing about the mob, which, you know, Luther mentions and Moses mentions in writing this account, is pretty clear. These people, these guys, see these visitors come, and they want to break in and rape them, right? So we, this is a pretty extreme situation. I mean, we, we were talking last week and sort of, you know, generalizing a bit about homosexuality and so forth, but you, you wouldn't want to, I don't think it's, it's fair to generalize too much out of this episode. I mean, whatever, you know, somebody's view might be, I mean, not that it's not justified or whatever, but, but uh, because this is a pretty extreme situation. You know, you're talking about these, this angry mob, this lynch mob, wanting to gang rape the emissaries of the Lord God. I mean, this is pretty extreme. It, was, it doesn't get much worse, right? So in the following week, I thought, I thought this is uh, this is hard to generalize out of. You know, you talk about gay culture or whatever. You can't really generalize from this because this is such an extreme, heinous situation. Um, but uh, I, I'm interested in the way that uh, Luther talks about uh, um, because there, there's kind of a slippery slope there between this discussion of the good God and the bad God, the good God and the wrathful God the Old Testament God and the New Testament God, because it's all the same God. Um, but but he handles it pretty well. He actually handles it, uh, you know, uh, to give some of my teachers credit. Uh, my teachers um, taught me, in the Orthodox faith, taught me the same thing, that God is a good God. God is good. God is all good. God doesn't punish people. God doesn't, you know, smite people, per se. That's something that we bring on ourselves for the most part. And when God does put trials and tribulations in our way, they're kind of a, a shaping process, just as a parent would sometimes, you know, impose a penalty on a child as a, as a teaching uh, tool. That's kind of what God does. Anyway, that's, I'm not kind of putting that out there as dogma, but, but that seems to be the direction that, um, that Luther is taking. So I think it's, you know, interesting the way he does that to talk about, you know, how God does these things. But, you know, for somebody, you know, engaged in this heinous, 
crime and sin against the emissaries of the Lord God, you know, it's you know not surprising that they were struck blind. Um, you know, if, and and you know later on in the short in the chapter, of course, the the whole town is nuked. But uh, but yeah, you know, I think it's interesting the way um, uh, you know Luther handles that view of wrath and retribution. And uh, Protestants are sometimes characterized by um, Catholics and Orthodox writers as having kind of a low view of humanity. And, you know, some historians, but historians hold out Luther as the exception. Uh, people are sinful kind of by nature. So if everybody's sinful, you know, kind of philosophical formula would be if, if all X are Y, then, you know, no X is Y or something like that. If everybody's sinful, then that's the new norm. That's the normal. Uh, so Luther, I think, sees that and doesn't hold up, doesn't, you know, doesn't get too much into, doesn't get to the extremes of human depravity in the way that John Calvin does, right? That people are just no damn good. And um, Luther, I think, holds up that people are sinful by, by nature, but that's kind of the result of turning away from God. And likewise, some of this, what we view as punishment, is uh, brought on ourselves by when we turn away from God. When we turn away from God, we reject God's help. And, um, you know, it's hard to get it... Uh, you know, that, that unforgivable sin that Christ mentions about the sin against the Holy Spirit. But one piece of that is if one rejects the Holy Spirit, of course, one doesn't has, have his aid, doesn't have his help, uh, doesn't have his assistance, his guidance. And I think, uh, you know, Luther shed some light on that. Yeah. Kind of what's going on today, like in, over in the Ukraine, that, you know, that type of evil. And uh, what I hear in the, you know, in the reports about uh, the abuses that uh, Putin's soldiers are doing to the Ukrainian civilians, you know, rape, you know, torture, <laughs> you go right down the list. Yeah. So that's, that's not surprising. I'll leave it at that. That's what the Russians did to the German women in World War II. Mass rape. Well, I think that the Stalin did atrocities were to the yeah. Ukrainians probably as bad or worse yeah, yeah. than Hitler did. If that's what you're referring to, yeah. Uh, I'm, well, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I know that about the Ukrainian genocide, but when the Russian soldiers came into Germany, that from the east, they uh, there were according to all the history I've read, there were widespread rapes of the German women. Oh yeah, yeah, I yeah I have I've read about that. It was kind of like it was payback or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. yeah. Okay, let's go on then. Uh, Dave, you want to take it? Yes, I'll read. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Sons-in-laws, daughter, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. For linguistic reasons, it is debated at this point whether Lot had more children, both sons and daughters, since the angels say that he had, that if he had any others in the city, he should take them out with them. Later on, only two daughters are mentioned. Yeah, that's the, that's the accounts I've heard. Yeah. I agree with, with Lyra's opinion that the angels are speaking in human fashion or as human beings are accustomed to speak, as though they, they did not know whether Lot 
had any others who belonged to his household or family. For above it was stated about Lot that he had so many cattle and herdsmen that he was unable to, to dwell with Abraham. Hmm. But here another question arises. Where had the cattle and the herdsmen remained? For the account that follows reveals nothing concerning them. I myself surely cannot reach a conclusion about this odd account, unless perhaps, as is likely, the herdsmen and the cattle were outside the city in the field and in some safe place. For the supposition of some that Lot, com compelled by want, had sold his cattle and had dismissed his domestics is not only unlikely, but also involves a reproach. If any, if, if however, there, there were in the city, it is, ex they were in the city, it was exceedingly shocking that even the servants in Lot's house were against their master and were involved in the same smugness in which the whole ungodly city lived. But let us leave this undecided since scripture makes no mention of it and states clearly that only four souls were saved, although eventually Lot's wife also perished on the way, and only the father and his two daughters were saved. But it is notable, it is a notable example of extraordinary wickedness that the godly head of the household was unable to keep either a single herdsman or a single maidservant in their calling. This very great offense that the master alone had the entire city against him deceived them all. Therefore, they, they thought as follows. Our master is a sincere and pious man. He indiscriminately receives whoever comes here as guests. Yet, as is the habit of the world, he is often poorly thanked for this. Thus, he has now brought harm upon himself by putting up these guests in his home against their will. It is unusual for the world to think that the saints are foolish and do many foolish things. Accordingly, when Lot preached about the coming punishment and wanted to save his household, they spurned him as a dotting and ridic ridiculously credulous old man. This idea pleases me more. And the examples show that domestics are usually wont to conduct themselves in this matter, especially in dangers, which reveal who are true fans and true and who are false. I would I would say that maybe he he offered these folks, the servants, a chance to go with him and they declined. That's what I would think happened. Because, you know, they were afraid. Yeah. In this passage, you should note the verb which the translator renders, bring out. It is the same verb that Moses employed above concerning Mel Mel Melchizedek. Uh, or, yeah. The, okay, so pronounce that for me again. I, Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Melchizedek, yeah. Uh, in the story of Abraham, namely that he brought out bread and wine. The Pappas distort this passage and explain it as referring to an offering or the mass. Although this word denotes nothing else than that Mel Melchizedek, Melchizedek, brought out bread and wine to be shared in common when he was about to welcome his victorious guest with this gift. Accordingly, the stubborn advocates of the ungodly, ungodly mass are refuted not only by the theologian who treats these events, but also by the, the theologian, theologian for it is absurd if the account of Melchizedek, you explain the verb to mean to sacrifice. 
and in this passage maintain that Lot was ordered by the angels to sacrifice all his possessions. Okay. What happened here? It, so Lot sacrificed his servants? No. Huh? No. The question was the, the word uh, and the um, the argumentation between the papist and the uh, Lutherans concerning what Melchizedek did. Melchizedek greeted the uh, return of the uh, of the warriors, Abraham and his group, and all the people that he brought back with him, including Lot and his family, and all their possessions, and he brought them back. Uh, and gave them to the king. Um, Melchizedek came out and he um, offered a thank you gift to Abraham. And Abraham gave him a tenth of his wealth. So that, I mean, that you're back to the story where Abraham saves Lot and the uh, and the people of, of Sodom, if you would, um, which was a few years earlier than all of this. So we're actually... Now, yeah. if, and he said that, that it wasn't, he did not offer a sacrifice. He offered them a thanksgiving gift, if you would. And uh, it points out that, uh, the Bible points out, Moses points out that Abraham uh, gave a tenth of, of everything to Melchizedek as a as a worship offering. Anything else? What's the so breath? I have a question. Yeah. Is that a I gift? Have a question. Yeah. So I have a question, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, so what what does Luther see as his as the main differences, the differences between the uh, the Roman Mass and the Lutheran Divine Service. Well, the the uh, in the Mass uh, when they have the uh, well, they did the they did the Mass without anybody there. They did a Mass for earning of uh, penance or. or um, like an indulgence type of thing. Uh, and they do that for the dead and uh, others. Their, their sacrifice of Christ and what takes place later, they think they have an unbloody sacrifice when they do the mass, which is the divine service, um, the, the giving of the body and blood. And they take it to themselves, a the priest, <clears throat> That's it. That's all that's necessary for the mass. So they, you know, do a mass and oh, well, I'll, you know, um, you know, they get paid for doing that or the, the other, but somehow they earn in their system um, penance uh, by to others. So <clears throat> I don't know much more about that system other than that because I don't adhere to it at all okay <laughs> we live by by grace through faith uh we don't earn our forgiveness not even our repentance earns forgiveness christ earned the forgiveness in his sacrifice and it, it was not unbloody that we and we uh we have the divine service and receive the Lord's body and blood, the uh, this sacrifice given and shed for us on the, on Calvary. We receive His body and blood in the in the divine service when we receive Holy Communion. But He's the one that makes it that, and it's not a sacrifice again. It's a giving of himself to you for faith, fellowship, forgiveness, 
uh, he in us and we in him in that respect. If more of the divine presence being present in with and under that bread and wine. So uh, that's different than the, the Roman Catholic mass in the thought that it somehow earns some type of credit. Yeah, they used, to, if I remember correctly, they used to be indulgences involved with attending mass. Yeah, well, no, things haven't changed as far as the yeah. Roman Catholic Church is how they see the their system of penance working. Yeah. So, buddy, where, where does the Orthodox service fall in that spectrum? Well, um, the you know the body and blood of Christ are present in the Eucharist, and uh, but in terms of celebration of the Mass um, or the liturgy, this is we don't use the word Mass; we use the word Divine Liturgy, yeah. and uh, um, which is broken down from Greek means. Uh, it has, it has to do with the, the participation of the people, work of the people is the way the, the Greek word breaks down. So that, uh, although it, my understanding is that Roman Catholic ordained priests are obliged to say the mass daily as part of the routine, part of their discipline and expectation. Uh, there was a, um, a Roman Catholic professor, I didn't know him, but I was invited to a, a, a seminar he gave once. And in preparation, I read a little bit about him. And uh, he was one of these people, of course, uh, that uh, celebrated the Mass daily. But one thing I read about him that was kind of interesting was that when he said the daily Mass at the university where he taught, he didn't like to say it by himself. He didn't think that was appropriate. So he'd go get, you know, the janitorial staff or whomever, right, <laughs> to form an audience, right? So I thought that was interesting. Um, his name was Ivan Illich. He uh, uh, wrote on a lot of things. Uh, even, you know, non-religious subjects. He wrote on, you know, global issues and so forth. But um, anyway, the, 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 in the Orthodox faith, there's, there's not a liturgy unless it's scheduled with uh, an audience there. I mean, somebody, the, the priest may take... Uh, communion to somebody who's ill in the hospital, right? But uh, other than that, there wouldn't be any, uh, and that, that's called, it was called a pre-sanctified liturgy. That's not really a, that's not a real liturgy. That's not a real mass. Uh, but, you know, aside from that, I thought it was interesting when I was asking the other week about, you know, somebody who was a, a forefigure or a likeness of Christ, it was actually Melchizedek that I was thinking of. Because I found Melchizedek to be a really interesting character. He's mentioned by St. Paul, and he's mentioned in this passage. And, you know, I've read about him, and I can't really find much, except that in Orthodox literature, he's always referred to as um, a kind of Christ, a Christ-like figure, a prefiguring of Christ. And so when I asked my teacher, Lydia Lazar, about this, and I've asked him more than once, he just gives me this circular answer. Well, he's a prefiguring of Christ. He's a type of Christ. And uh, so what we know about him is he was the priest king of Jerusalem. And if you look at the, the translation, it can either be king, be read in Hebrew as king of Jerusalem or the king of peace, right? So he's, he's viewed as this kind of Christ-like character. But as regards to this bread and wine being um, a prefiguring of the mass, and the other thing is the... Uh, the U- word Eucharist is from a gr- gr- Greek word meaning ephkaristo, which means uh, thank you, right? Yeah. And uh, so that's, so it's, the Eucharist is, is a thanks. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't think that the Catholics are all that off base as seeing the bread and wine offering as a kind of prefiguring of the Mass or the Eucharist. Because a lot of other writers mention that, like, the miracles of Christ, the bread and wine, the turning the water into wine, uh, the loaves and the fishes, you know, right, writers will say, well, that's kind of a prefiguring of, of the mass of the Eucharist. And I don't think that's 
you know, it's not totally off base. I, I don't I, know if it's yes. really so, I but, I, I, but I, don't think it's, I don't think it's really harmful. I, I see that different, buddy. I think it's just an act of hospitality. That's what I see. The, um, the offering of the, the bread and the wine, um, the difference between the two as Luther is discussing it, is that the, um, the Catholic uh, position at that time was pushing that that, that was a sacrifice. Um, and then you have the, the act of the adoration of the host, um, which is part of the Catholic tradition. That, uh, that pushes on almost idolatry. Uh, if not, well, well, it, it, the, probably the strongest case you see made for that in Christian literature is uh, the Last Supper, and a lot of writers will talk about the Last Supper being a Eucharist, and um, there's a there are differences with what I don't know if it's exactly what Christ is doing at the Last Supper is exactly the same as what happens in the Eucharist. I think there's a, yeah, you know, a bond there, a lot of closeness. It's, it's, a, it's very similar. But, um, you know, I think the case for these other things is a lot weaker. You know, the, the bread and wine from, from uh, uh, Melchizedek, for example. Uh, the, 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 I mean, you've got, you know, if you read it, if you were to read it in Aramaic and, who knows if Matthew's gospel was originally in Aramaic, but if, if you read, if you were to read this passage in Hebrew, it would be the, 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 it would be something like the Prince of Peace offered bread and wine. And if you looked at a passage like that in Aramaic or Hebrew, it would have a lot of overtones for a Christian. Yeah, and there's no question that this is a type. You you find also Melchizedek, I believe, in Hebrews uh, discussed, stated. But, um, you know, what I was talking about, the adoration of the host and, and that type of thing, which has been added to and is part of the... Oh, oh yeah, yeah, of course. That, that's... Um, that's a, a great uh, difficulty um, because we've made an object something that uh, is something that is worshipped. Um, yes, we receive the blood and uh, the body and blood of Christ in in the actual presentation of the Holy Eucharist, if you want to speak Eucharist rather than Lord's Supper. But we also remember that it's in the middle of the. Um, uh, it sits in Laban, the the cradle of the of the Passover, where the death angel really you know is passing over us in that respect, because we have received uh, and and have Christ in His presence with us. Uh, so that's a, a a lot of difference, and we don't. We don't put it in a container and hold it up and pray to it and that type of thing. Um, that, like I said, to me, that's borderline idolatry. So when does that begin, that practice? It's not mentioned in scriptures. Do we know? That goes back into the Middle Ages. Uh, Middle Ages? Well, that and that's the best I can tell you. I'm sure that they have a big write-up or something on it if you were searching it out. Um, it's something that, you know, since it's not part of our theology at all, uh, I don't normally spend a lot of time there. Okay, let's go on with the readings. We still have 10 minutes left of this hour period. Uh, buddy, you want to take it from there? 
Uh, so Lot went out and said to his son-in-law, um, is that where we are? Am I at the right place? Right. Yeah, I think so. You got it, 14. Okay. So I, I, I lost my, my train of thought there. So Lot went out and, saw, and said to his son-in-law, uh, who were to marry his daughters, up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. They seem to his son-in-law to be te to be jesting. After the people of Sodom were exhausted by their searching and were overcome by sleep, Lot, having been commanded by the angels to do so, goes out to warn his sons-in-law, uh, to whom he was about to give his daughters, that they should be on their guard and escape from the impending destruction. But they too seem to be suffering from the effects of their intoxication on the previous day, to say even laugh at the pious old man. They thought, what? Would the Lord so suddenly destroy this place? How foolishly credulous you are to believe these guests or they're, they're imposters. If anything like this were impending, there would surely be some evidence of the disaster which is about to happen. Now, however, everything is gay and serene and you dream of destruction. It always happens this way. The nearer the world is to destruction, the smugger it is. It not only laughs at threats, but believes that it is altogether impossible that it should perish so suddenly. Noah warns of the flood that is to come and calls his fellow citizens to repentance, but he is laughed at and believed to be out of his wits because of senility. We too preach about the Son of God who will come to pronounce judgment and will consign the ungodly to eternal fire. But when the Pope and his cardinals either read or hear this, they laugh at us as it is an impossible event and say, what if heaven should fall down? Thus the story is told about Pope Leo that he once invited two philosophers to dinner. One of them discussed the immortality of the soul, the other discussed its mortality. When after a long hot debate, the Pope had to decide which of the two had spoken more correctly, he said to him who had defended the immortality of the soul, to be sure you seem to be stating facts, but your opponent's discourse creates a cheerful countenance. Epicureans are in the habit of doing this over against the clear truth that they caught, uh, draw conclusions that suit the flesh and reason. In other words, I guess if the soul is mortal, eat, drink, and be merry is what, you know, I hear Luther getting at there. Yeah. But let us not uh, disregard the threats or disdain them. Um, for Lyra is correct when he states that Lot's son law represent those who when they hear the threat of God's judgment, laugh and declare that it is delusion. But you will say, if Lot's sons-in-law were such men, why did the godly old man let them have his daughters? It should be a parent's first concern that he seek a relationship by marriage with the godly and not join his children with the ungodly. My answer is Lot had a little church in which he taught and propagated the true knowledge of God. Undoubtedly, his sons-in-law were also in this church for this reason, Lot thought that they were pious and saintly, for he could not look back, he could not look into their hearts, that they were hypocrites. They feigned godliness for a time, but now they revealed uh, their true character when they laughed at the word. Because they laugh, they perish, for they uh, do not believe that the angel Lot is speaking in earnest. They make sport of and laugh at him as if he were insane. This is surely a notable account. No matter how righteous we may be, it should be proclaimed in the church frequently, lest we fall into the madness of the antinomians who remove the law from the church, as if everybody in the church were actually a saint, and there were no need for such examples of God's wrath. The world, of course, is fond of such teachers, as in the book of Jeremiah, that people say, speak the things that, that please us. But St. Paul does not want the church to be led astray by pleasing speeches. For sin should be denounced and God's wrath should be exhibited for the sake of the unbelievers who are in the church. Yes, also for the sake of the believers, lest they should yield to sin, which still adheres to them and to their natural weakness. Thus, even though Christ himself must pleasant, most pleasantly invite sinners to come to him, he nevertheless repeatedly cries out the it cries out the awful woe over the impenitent Pharisees. But I had almost forgotten that at this point, something should also be said about the angels who boast. As it were, 
that they have been sent to destroy the cities. They say, we're about to destroy the place. And likewise, the Lord has sent us to destroy it. This is just as if they were boasting of being executioners and God's destroyers and ravagers. This, however, seems to describe the duty and the power of the angels. Elijah, Elisha, and others, as it is stated in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, um, also performed great miracles, but not by their own strength. Prayers and faith must be added, and from these, as from uh, a causa sin qua non, as the philosophers call it, miracles result. Thus Peter prays, and in faith in Christ, he bids the, the lame man rise, but the angels are powerful. Consequently, they perform miracles by reason of the strength given to them when they were created. It's certainly true that God governs the visible world not only through men, but also through angels. Of course, he could kill thieves without the services of an executioner, without the verdict of an officer of the state, as, as he sometimes does, especially in the case of murderers. He could also create human beings without the union of a male and female, just as he created Adam and Eve. But it has pleased the divine majesty to make use of the help and services of human beings, evidently in order to reveal his marvelous divine power in his creatures, and when he did not, uh, whom he did not want to be idle. Therefore, Paul in Corinthians calls us all God's fellow workers, for he makes use of our help for various purposes, just as he makes use of the help of the angels whom he endowed with such great might that he, he that that by their own or innate power they are able to destroy lands and peoples if God is with them. Moreover, it's a great glory to be endowed with such great might. For it is well known that at the time King Hezekiah, the angel of the, the Lord, killed 185,000 Assyrians in a single night and by a single assault in Second Kings. And Christ praises the might of the angels when he tells Peter and Matthew about the 12 legions. So a single angel would have been enough to turn back and destroy the enemies of Christ. Indeed, the story of Job proves that even the wicked angels are endowed with great power. It is profitable to know these facts. They serve to comfort the godly, but to frighten the ungodly. For we who believe must be certain that the, the princes of heaven are with us. Not one or two, but a great multitude of them, as is recorded in Luke that the heavenly hosts uh, were with the shepherds. Uh, but if we were without their protection, the Lord did not restrain the fury of Satan in this manner, we would not remain alive for a single moment. From the account of Job, one can gather, uh, sure enough, proof of what Satan is able to do and of what he, de he, what he desires most. He stirs up storms, hurls thunderbolts, or in the language of scripture, lets fire fall from heaven. He sends enemies, he even infects the body and covers it with boils. Therefore, the good angels are busy, busy in order that the fierce enemy may not inflict harm. Neither medicine nor other means would be effective by themselves if the angels were not present. And the fact that new remedies became known when new diseases made their appearance, this is not a matter of the diligence of human beings. It is the service of the angels who direct an urge on the hearts of the physicians, just as Satan directs and urges on his own, as Paul bears witness in Ephesians. Accordingly, what Moses states in this passage about the good angels who lay waste and destroy the earth, uh, the earth serves in the first place to teach us the fear of God, uh, since we have such a powerful opponent in Satan. In the second place, it teaches us to trust in the goodness of God, who has appointed such excellent princes and leaders through whom he, is my, he mightily defends his people. Everybody is aware of what Satan achieves through the Turk, the Roman Pope, and the fanatical spirits, not only by attacking bodies, but by seizing uh, souls and holding them captive. But the protection of the angels, which God wanted to be more powerful than Satan, gives us comfort. This government of God through his creatures is wonderful because the angels who support the godly defend the entire human race, even those exposed to lions, wolves, dragons, and all the horrible uh, 
leaders of Satan who have been trained to inflict harm, not only with the sword plagues and countless diseases, uh, but also with heresies of every kind. Thus, it evidently pleads God to reveal his uh, glory through his creatures, but in a different way. Elijah commanded fire to fall from heaven, and the fire obeyed his word and faith. Similarly, he commanded heaven to rain, but not by the power of the angels who do such things by their own power or by means of a gift given to them by creation. If the saints do anything like this, they bring it about through faith and prayer. Above, we dealt with the question whether Lot did not sin when he worshipped the angels. What the angels state in this passage, that they were sent by the Lord, pertains to this question. Accordingly, he is not speaking as with angels, but as with the Lord. Just as the works done at God's behest and command are also correctly called God's works. Therefore, Christ too says in Luke, He who hears you, hears me. Likewise, in Matthew, whatever you have done to the least of mine, you have done to me. It's a general uh, rule, uh, rule that uh, whether something good is done through human beings or through angels, you must conclude that it has been done by the Lord and give him the credit for it. Um, Want to pause or looks like we've got a ways Yeah, we can to go before. pause at that point. Um, that whole question that, that Luther brought up, there at the end concerning the angels and the worship of the angels. Um, again, my uh, my understanding really is that we're talking about the pre-incarnate Christ, and that was the angel in which uh, Lot was worshiping. And for some who would think that, oh, Christ, uh, you know, he wouldn't do inflict this punishment um, is to forget the whole book of Revelation and uh, Christ as uh, the one leading the battle against uh, the devil and and all those in under his control. So uh, that struggle about who to worship in, in Revelation, he's had the same thing. Uh, where John was told not to worship the angel and he was a, a fellow servant. So that's, you know, that's just a different perspective on it. Um, I don't know. Do you have any questions or thoughts concerning it? Well, the angels are, were, or are, more uh, powerful than Satan, isn't that what the, they were saying? No, I, I'm not going to say that either. You know, um, certain angels may be, others may not be. Um, remember, even the angel Gabriel uh, did not become Satan's accuser. And there's a statement in that in the scriptures concerning it. And human beings are stupid enough to to uh, think that they can control him or that they can test or tempt him by their actions, that they have some type of control there, then that's, that's foolishness. You know, he's, uh, he's on a tight chain, but, you know, you get in range of that chain and your life can become really, really bad. Well, Satan is kind of, to me, he was, he's a prisoner of his own accord. That's what I would say. Because he was he he was thrown out of heaven, or he yeah. But I don't think he there's an option for him to to uh, get out of jail free card, let's say, and uh, come home. Well, the, the the book of Revelation talks about him being released for a little while. So the question is, one little while that uh, he goes around like a, a raging lion looking for who he can destroy. Um, there's a lot of statements about it. Um, I've never spent any real time studying Satan because I, my trust and my faith is in Christ and I want to stay away from such things. Um, this uh, Satan worship and, and people who, you know, claim to be worshipers of Satan, uh, 
I think that's probably the biggest craziness I've ever run into. Well, I guess I could make a case that uh, maybe Satan is uh, somebody who, like, just like you said, is somebody that we should just just kind of cast aside. Yeah. yeah. So, we should cast out of our thoughts and we should stay, keep our minds and, and thoughts and everything in Christ. Because, you know, as much as... Uh, the the world though I'd like to say that there's no demon possession, it does take place. And if you go play around with it, you can expect that uh, you're gonna get burned. Buddy, you got anything on that? Well, I, you know, the orthodox view is that uh it's a little bit different from the Protestant one is that uh, through Christ's resurrection, incarnation resurrection, he overcame sin, death, and the devil. Yeah. And as you say, the devil's, the devil's on a tight leash, but it's up to us to overcome him by degrees, as one of my teachers taught me. But also when one of my teachers wrote, I was rereading recently over... Pascha, Easter, was that uh, Satan's chief tool was fear. And the greatest fear that humans have is fear of death. And so once that, that fear of death was overcome by Christ, then they gave us a lot of latitude to, you know, in terms of, you know, spiritual liberation. You know, Christ freed us by freeing us from the fear of death that Satan used as a medium of control. Okay. Well, I guess I get to the question maybe next week is if the angels had power over uh, Satan, then... Well, I mean, Satan... Satan was a kind of archangel, and that uh, Dionysius that I was, you know, quoting that Luther kind of sometimes refers to obliquely, uh, he writes a great deal on um, angels and the hierarchy of angels, but, you know, his, his word is not dogma, uh, Dionysius, but he writes a lot about it, and he set the, the pattern for what Christian theologians after that tended to follow, but uh, he talks about the order of angels and, you know, as pastor has mentioned, you have Gabriel and Raphael and Michael who are referred to in the scriptures as the archangels. Then you have these kind of ordinary kind of messenger angels that are running around and you could refer to dark angels, but they're oftentimes just referred to as demons. Demons and the bad angels are kind of synonymous. Uh, but it, they're they're disembodied spirits, and uh, I mean they, they have no bodies, and and of course they, you know, people project some kind of imagery on them, you know, you know, and and they can kind of project a kind of imagery, but it's kind of like a hologram, you know, they're they're they don't have physical bodies, and so uh, they have influence, but you know, just like Satan, they're not controlling anything. They're, they're there for, the good angels are there for help and guidance, and the bad ones are there kind of as agents of temptation. But in and of themselves, I don't think they have a lot of, of implicit force. They don't make anybody do anything. They're just an instrument. Satan, huh? say, say, Satan doesn't make anybody do anything. Christ has... You know, Christ, uh, you know, kind of put it into that in Golgotha and, and that, at, uh, you know, and, and, you know, the resurrection. Um, but, you know, he, we can, you know, as Pastor said, we can open ourselves up to that. And people that engage in sort of these satanic enterprises, whether they're full-scale Satan worship or whether they're, you know, some kind of 
occult interest or whatever, uh, open themselves up to that. That's, that's actually the position of the Roman Catholic Church as regard to exorcism. You know, if you read their, their literature on exorcism, you know, that's what they say themselves. People open themselves up to that through these activities. And it's not like Satan kind of grabs people and forces them to do something. People make themselves vulnerable and, you know, Satan and these demons come along and they kind of help out. And just as Luther says, as regards to the kingdom of God, and I'm really paraphrasing uh, an Anglican clergyman when I say this, is that, you know, God can build the kingdom all by himself, right? God doesn't need us to do that, but he gives us the opportunity to help out. And so, you know, God can do things all by himself. Satan can't do things all by himself. He needs our help more than, you know, <laughs> to, to do things. Oh, I think Satan's in his own hell. That's what I think. If he's a prisoner. But, but he, he, he gets yeah. plenty of help from it. Well, you know, we're always willing, we're always, always willing to help him out. It's, we're, we're always willing to help Satan create hell. I just don't, I don't know what satisfaction Satan gets out of uh, <laughs> tormenting us. <laughs> his, his satisfaction is trying to destroy what God has made. So it's because of his anger uh, towards God. It's personal with him and God. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're just kind of caught in the <laughs> crossfire. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, I, I think you have to be Satan to really, to really thoroughly understand it, Dave. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around. <laughs> Make your friendship with Christ and leave that one out. <laughs> Let's have a uh, closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us this day. We give thanks to you for Christ and for. Forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation through his mighty work. We pray thanksgiving for you sending your spirit, the spirit of Christ into our lives, helping us in our faith and love towards you. We ask you, Lord, to continue to, to be with us and you can give us the strength and the will to be a blessing to others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.